Hey, and hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar, Start to Part, the Design to Manufacturing Experience. As Bob said, my name is Lauren Nickerson. I'm an application engineer with computer-aided technology. And I'd like to introduce my co-presenter, Drew Buchanan. Hey, everybody. I'm happy to be here. So um, I am a simulation specialist with CACI and happy to be uh, spending uh, your lunch hour with us uh, with this webinar. So Drew and I are going to take you along a journey. We designed a part from concept to production ready. We'll show you how virtual prototypes can catch design issues early on in the design phase, how physical prototypes can catch those things that your virtual prototype doesn't test for, and how the SOLIDWORKS suite of products can help you make informed, calculated, and smart design decisions. So I'm going to start with a question. Has this ever happened to you? Now, with your headset, there's really no good place for it. And it really, it tethers me to my computer. And my cell phone, it likes to play hide and seek. So I get yanked back into my seat, you know, and I, I spill my drink. My headset falls time and time again. It breaks, you know what? Or it causes me to fall and break. Essentially, it's a workplace hazard. So the application engineers at Computer Aided Technology decided to brush off those cobwebs and lace up their product developer shoes and we're walking the talk to solve a real world problem. So using the Solid, SolidWorks suite of products, our AE team conceptualized, designed, simulated, and fabricated, basically developed from scratch a wireless cell phone charging stand with a headset support for our office. It was a complete design to manufacture experience. So Drew and I will give you a brief overview. SOLIDWORKS PDM Professional managed all the design data and related documents in one secure location. It tracks all the design history, and it makes sure the team is working on the most current design. The electrical engineers sourced and provided the wireless charging components and LEDs, and using SOLIDWORKS PCB made sure it all fit. Using traditional hand sketching and cutting edge touch devices, our industrial designers created several design concepts. Mechanical engineers collaborated to further develop the concepts into manufacturable products using SOLIDWORKS 3D CAD. Our 3D printing application engineers used Stratasys 3D printers to generate several design iterations to evaluate form, fit, and function. By utilizing the virtual prototypes, Simulation experts analyzed many aspects of each design, including stress and strain, the impact of heat generation, and plastic flow for manufacturability. All right, so first let's look at the conceptual design process. So our two industrial designers got to work sketching design directions and modeling concepts. Todd Myers and myself, <clears throat> we conceptualized a stand that maximized accessibility while minimized or even eliminated the footprint of yet another item on our crowded desk. We packaged it up with thoughtful and creative design decisions that worked within the manufacturing and cost constraints. So we decided to move forward with two concepts, the transporter and the holster. The transporter has an ultra slim profile and is focused on portability. From the back, hinged levers become stabilizing feet and an upper hinged arm supports the headset. So the transporter design gracefully folds into itself to be tucked away into, into your computer bag or a desk drawer. Now the holster, it mounts to your laptop monitor. It removes both the cell phone and the headset from the surface of your workspace. So initially we had three concepts. The phone's either in the landscape or the portrait orientation, and it's mounted to either the top or the side of the monitor. So with these two design directions chosen, development begins. But since our team was spread out across the country, we recognized the need for a collaborative PDM environment. The PDM specialists allotted some space on one of our servers and created a virtual machine to spin up SOLIDWORKS PDM Professional. Using the wizard and just about 13 clicks of the mouse, we created a new vault using the SOLIDWORKS PDM Quick Start. We easily modified the workflow to establish a simple environment robust enough for all of our needs and it meets our demands. 
With the addition of Soft Ether VPN, we worked jointly on ideas to overcome those design challenges, and we shared lots and lots of files. So with SOLIDWORKS PDM in place, our team of application engineers can be assured they're working on the most current information in a secure environment. All right, let's talk about development. Well, that includes mechanical engineering, electrical design, design simulation and validation, and 3D printing. It's really hard to talk about any of these as an individual task because they happened at the same time. It was a concurrent approach to product design. So instead, let's look at the journey for both the transporter and the holster from beginning to final prototype. So Drew, why don't you start us off? Great, thank you, Laura. So um, we'll start with the electronics out of my screen for you. Um, as it applies to both designs, uh, obviously we needed to really set everything up to be able to wireless charge. So our first selection were the electrical components. First chose a Qi enabled device this is based on a favorable balance of size, power rating, efficiency, and price. We also selected Danpra LED strip lights based on their low profile, side emitting light, and that it could be cut to length. So some of the design challenges. Obviously, um, the first thing is we wanted to make sure that we'd be able to charge our phone. So we came up with a design efficiency of 75%. You know, we drop that phone on the device, we get at least 75% efficiency of charging. So with that being said, we also had to make sure that our charger's coil, coil location was within the receiver uh, coil location. So we determined about 0.2 of an inch. Obviously, this is also thinking about the future and different SKUs, so different wireless charging locations within each phone. We wanted to have enough distance to allow that alignment. Lastly, our design challenge is we wanted to make sure that we had LED illumination. So how would we be illuminating this? Would it be inside the housing? Would it be outside the housing? And how would those LEDs be powered? So with that being said, our first order of business was really to lay out the board and kind of give you guys a nice understanding of how we did that. We utilized SolidWorks PCB. SolidWorks PCB is a standalone schematic capture and board layout tool. So it allows your electrical engineer or your, your schematic designer to lay out the board seamlessly with your mechanical CAD. So in this case, SOLIDWORKS uh, mechanical CAD. Let's take a look. So you see right here, we have our schematic set up. And we're, we actually want to push back this board design to our mechanical design. So the schematic itself is set up with a um, non-rounded edges. And we need to round those edges for the actual mechanical design. So we're saying we're going to push this design back to actual SOLIDWORKS Mechanical CAD, PCB, and we bring this PCB directly back into SOLIDWORKS. Great. You see right there, there's our, our finished board design of all the components. And then we're bringing in our, our uh, mechanical design for our board itself, easily just aligning it through just general SOLIDWORKS relations. And then we're making a change to the actual PCB itself. You see, when you bring in the board, it actually brings it in as a mechanical CAD and we can make those changes to the component itself. It's great because this really optimizes our design and makes sure it fits the mechanical design component. Great, so now that I finished this, I need to push it back to PCB to update our, our board schematic. As easy as that, just pushing it straight back to PCB, then updating it. And you see at the finish, now we have the update with those um, indentations, the curved edges for our PCB. Great. So with the PCB now designed, we had we, we ensured our design as well for the actual coil itself. So we maintained that distance of 0.2 of an inch. We did this by minimizing the overall wall thickness of our mechanical CAD part, as you'll see in subsequent slides. Additionally, we wanted to have the coil in different locations for future SKUs, and that pertained to our actual coil distance, 0.2 of an inch. Lastly, we decided to make things as easy as possible for the user. We decided that the LEDs would be jumped directly from the PC itself. So all the user would have to do is plug into the outlet, and that would power both the PC, uh, uh, PCB as well as the LED strip. Finally, we decided we wanted to utilize a transparent or translucent material to ensure that the illumination would be great. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it back to Laura. 
um, to go over more in depth the transporter itself. All right, thanks, Drew. So with the electronics set, here's the journey of the transporter. So the engineering challenge for the transporter are the hinges. In the original design, the hinge for the stabilizing feet were located at the bottom of the housing, and when in storage, the feet hinged up. Although it's very cool, there were initial concerns that these hinges would work against gravity, and it was going to require some hefty detents to prevent accidental folding. So a decision was made to modify the design so that the hinge for the stabilizing feet was located at the top, and it acted like a kickstand. Our mechanical engineer, Dave Janicki, made the changes to, to the design. It's still the same aesthetic. Now it works with gravity. So it's still very cool, and it's now stable. So we overcame that first challenge of gravity. Next is the hinge design's strength. So stepping through the PDM workflow, we notified our simulation expert, Mr. Drew Buchanan. These parts are ready to run the analysis on the hinge design. So SOLIDWORKS simulation allowed our engineers to test early on, on an incomplete design, to validate the hinge. So Drew, why don't you take us through what you did? Take a look at this. And the great thing about this is we'll actually be taking a look directly at SOLIDWORKS simulation. So if you, for those of you who haven't touched SOLIDWORKS simulation, it's an FEA tool. Um, and it can really run the gamut to the types of problems we can encounter. And you'll see that in this presentation. The first thing I always like to point out the new users to this is that it's an integrated CAD FEA tool. Um, this is great because it allows the user to make a lot of different changes. And that's what we were doing during this process. We had different configurations. We were working with different assemblies, different part, part designs. And um, with that being said, we could really utilize making a change on the fly and then simulating it in solder simulation. The first thing I'll point out, CAD embedded, um, capable of both um, single body part, multi body part, as well as an assembly, which you're seeing it in this case, this is a SOLIDWORKS assembly file. So great. Um, Dave and Laura handed off this CAD file to me, and then I jumped into the actual static simulation to set this up. First thing we do is we actually apply our material properties. So in this case, we have a polycarbonate material. Um, so we um, find our material for each of the individual components. Um, great thing about this is that this material database, if you're curious, um, it's fully seamless with the actual mechanical CAD database, meaning that if you're already in the habit of defining your materials within SOLIDWORKS, um, when you start a new simulation study, it will bring those materials in. Additionally, if you want to have um, maybe just define different materials within the actual simulation interface, you can do that. All you have to do is right-click in it. Great. So we defined our materials. Uh, that's our first process in the system, um, defining a polycarbonate material. Then we move on to our actual um, boundary conditions in the system. So how is our part interacting in reality? So what we're doing is we're virtualizing the physical testing in the system. So in this case, we have our contacts X. Great thing about this is we know contacts or different parts are going to interact differently. So you think about a weld, um, you can simulate that in FEA versus something that's a hinge, which is something that's going to rotate. So we use the combination of both a bonded contact and no penetration contacts to set up the system. So properly simulating components that were glued or welded or snapped together, as well as components that had free range uh, rotation, which would be a no penetration contact set. Great, so we defined our contact sets in the system. Then it's just a process of defining our loads and fixtures. In our case, we are fixing this before, saying that it's gonna be fixed for baseline analysis, and then we're specifying our different types of loads. In our case, um, we have a couple different loads. The first thing is we want to factor in the weight. So we can apply a gravity load, um, and because we've already designed this in SOLIDWORKS and we have applied a density, it can factor in the weight of the system. A couple things I'll point out to people, um, a lot of you are in different industries. The great thing about this is I can adjust this gravity load. So it's not, you're not bound by 9.81. I could have it, actually have it as a fraction of the value. Maybe I want it as half, or maybe I want to have 2G. Whatever you want to key in, you can do that. Additionally, you can apply gravity in multiple directions. So um, maybe I have, you know, typically automotive will do a test for 2G and 3G loading. I could do that. In our case, we just wanted the weight, so we just had a normal gravity load applied to the system. Great. Um, then we just had to apply the weight of the cell phone itself. 
Um, and you can do that through a non-uniform distribution, which is pretty cool. We can see in the equation, you know, obviously that weight's going to distribute based on where it's located differently, so you can actually key in a non-uniform distribution, uh, distribution of force. And then also we had a force for the headset itself, right here on our top surface. Great. So at that point, we can run our scenario. And just for reference, the um, uh, tensile strength of polycarbonate material is about 6,600 PSI. So um, we wanted to make sure we were nowhere near that limit to sort of proceed with actual physical prototyping. When we actually take a look at the results, we see that we have a max stress locating around the top of the system, but the max stress we were attaining was about 15 PSI. So nowhere near that limit, we had pretty strong confidence moving forward um, from a prototyping perspective that we wouldn't have any mechanical failures. Great. So, that being said, I'd say, uh, Laura, um, that's a thumbs up in terms of being able to catch those issues early because we're at adequate PSI level or nowhere near a failure limit of 6,600 PSI. I'm going to hand it back to Laura. Okay. <clears throat> That's good news. Thumbs up. All right, so let's move forward. Let's change the state and we'll notify the 3D printing team to build us a model. Well, there's nothing like a physical model. The first build showed a few oversights in the design, something that simulation is just not going to catch. So we received three components, the housing, the kickstand, and the headset support. Well, the problem was that there was no provisions in the design to actually assemble the kickstand and the headset support. So these parts should have been 3D printed in place, but with a little finesse from a chisel and a hammer, the parts were assembled. But now there's no easy way to access the kickstand and pull it out from the housing. Again, the chisel to the rescue. And finally, the hinge holes were a little bit too tight for the hinge pins, but we persevered and here is our first prototype. Dave modified the design, access was provided to the kickstand. Someone, someone's gonna remain nameless. They adjusted the size of the hinge holes to allow the parts to be 3D printed in place. Easy, minor modifications, right? Quick loop in the PDM workflow and a second prototype was built. Now, we've all experienced this. One change has a ripple effect and ripple effects are never good. That hinge hole, it's oversized. And now the kickstand over rotates out from the housing, shortening the overall unit, and the headset drags on the desktop, totally defeating the purpose. But on the upside, the hinges are working. The hinge held the cell phone, and by propping up the stand, we confirm that in fact the top hinge does hold the headset with no problem. Simple modifications to the hinge, quick loop in the workflow, and third time's a charm. The 3D printed prototype works great. So the physical prototypes provided valuable insight into our design. Those things, simulation's not gonna catch. Simulation's not gonna catch an oversized hole. So for that, we give that a thumbs up. Now the end goal has always been to design the product for mass production. The front and the back housings of the transporter can be a straightforward clamshell mold. But now the new challenge is how will the kickstand and the headset support be assembled in mass production? I mean, seriously, we can't mold in place. So we created a new configuration in SOLIDWORKS for mass production. In a PDM professional, we use the branch and merge command to explore different concepts for assembly. So one branch is to assemble the parts from the outside. We're gonna to squeeze together the hinge pin area just enough to allow the pins to snap into the hinge holes. And to increase flexibility, we designed in relief cuts at the pin locations. So this looks promising, right? We merged our branch, creating a new version of PDM. But the question is, 
will these relief cuts compromise the strength of the hinge? So we called on drill. Great, thanks, Laura. So the great thing about this is Laura and Dave sent this file directly to me. And all I had to do was copy this existing simulation to a new configuration um, within simulation. And then by doing this, the, connect the connections were copied, the fixtures and loads were copied, and then the mesh was generated. So you see right here, you have the gravity load, you have all the fixtures. I didn't have to go back and reset up the project. Great, so once the project was set up, I had to remesh the results. You see right there, the refined results. And then all I had to do was click and run. So upon running it, um, the stress value did go up a little bit, jumped up to 25 PSI. But still, remember, the uh, tensile limit for polycarbonate material is about 6,000 um, PSI. So we're nowhere near that limit. I'd say we're still pretty good to catch any potential issues and move forward for prototypes. So I say that's a thumbs up, Laura. Awesome. Thanks, Drew. And now, meanwhile, Dave had been busy assembling the electronics. The PCB and the charging coil will be assembled to charge an iPhone. And the LEDs on the PC board will radiate through a transparent wall in the housing. Okay, so we've reached our final destination with the transporter. With SOLIDWORKS simulation, we felt confident in our design by incorporating virtual prototypes at an early stage. And we validated our findings with the physical prototypes. So we made informed, calculated, and smart design decisions. Let's now take a look at the holster's journey. And as a reminder, we had three initial concepts varying the orientation and location of the cell phone stand. So, after a grueling competitive product analysis and extensive market research, which was essentially all of us looking at each other and saying, well, which one do you like? Which one do you like? And, you know, majority rules, we decided to move forward with the side holster. James Rear, our mechanical engineer, modeled up the holster. So this design hangs on the side of your laptop monitor with the cell phone in a portrait orientation at a very comfortable eye level. And then the headset hangs to the side of the cell phone charger. And we added some lights. Now the holster design has its share of issues and engineering challenges. I mean, the whole system is cantilevered off the side of the laptop monitor. Now my gut feel was that, yep, <clears throat> excuse me, we can just hang this on the monitor. It's gonna butt up against the side of the monitor. It's gonna stay in place, no problem. Hmm. True. What was your gut feel? Did you think this would work? No, I, I'd say, Laura, that's the great thing about simulation. I wanted to jump right back into simulation to prove this out. So we can take a look at this. Great. Great. So how I, how I went about solving this is the great thing about this is we can use a kinematic simulation tool. So that would be SOLIDWORKS Motion where we're factoring in the inertial effects and we really can utilize the mates we'd already set up in the system. So those who've never used SOLIDWORKS Motion, we can key in different loads. Um, in this case, our frictional contacts, um, so solid body contacts, as well as gravity. All right, so here's the overall results of this analysis. So I'd say that's, that's a failure, Laura. Oh my. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty dramatic. And, you know, I really did think it was going to work. So, obviously, the holster falls off the monitor. And that's the thumbs down. So, we'll need to add some sort of a mechanism to keep it attached. So, James designed some spring clips to be assembled to the inside of the back wall of the monitor hook. The spring clip is gonna do two things for us. First, it's gonna account for dis different size laptop monitors. And secondly, it will apply pressure to lock the stand in place. Sounds good, easy enough. So we notified the 3D printing team. Let's build us a model. Well, just like with the transporter, there's a lot of information gained from a physical prototype. The spring clips were 3D printed with a flexible material, and honestly, they were too flexible. And assembling the spring clips was extremely difficult. So, of the several clips fabricated, 
Here is a video of the best result. All right, there's the spring clip inside there. Slide it on the monitor. Looking good so far. Here's the headset. And, well, no. Another thumbs down. Needless to say, we need to rebuild those clips and we need to rethink the assembly method. James made the changes to the design. The spring clips were shortened and moved to a more accessible location. Quick transition in PDM and the 3D printing team built a second prototype shown here. Initially, we saw a much better result. But with the load of the cell phone and the headset, the system became unstable. And here's the result. A casualty. Again, another thumbs down. We need to move on, right? We needed a new attaching method, some sort of a clamping mechanism. But time was also moving on. And before going through the time and effort of complete redesign and having models made, we just wanted a proof of concept model, a feasibility study, a down and dirty model, just to see if some sort of a clamp would work. So one look around our messy desk, and there it was. It's a binder clip. What can you not do with a Dremel and some duct tape? Here we go. The binder clip is in place. Our headset. The cell phone. This is a true MacGyver moment, and in true MacGyver fashion, it worked. It is not pretty, but the binder clip held. And finally, we get a thumbs up. So back in PDM, we checked out the files and we started hacking and slashing the design. We felt comfortable working on the same model, knowing we could always use that get command to restore a previous version if this didn't work out. So we designed the hinging clamp, a stabilizing foot, and the spring shown here is just for representation. But what we really needed was for someone, and if you all could see me, I'd be looking straight at Drew right now, someone to tell us what is the spring force of a binder clip, and then we can source the appropriate spring. So Drew, can you tell us how you de determine the spring force of a binder clip? Great, yeah. So the great thing about this is we know a binder clip is a torsional spring. And as you'll see um, in a later slide, um, there's a nice, there's so many different types of torsional springs out there. So the great thing about this is I went into PDM, checked out this file, um, and was able to set up the system. In this case, we have our, our loads of our headset and our phone, um, which are very familiar from what you've seen before. But now we have a couple of different components here. The great thing about SOLIDWORKS simulation is you can simulate these rotations with different stiffness values. So in this, we did it through virtualized pin connectors, which act in the same way as what a, a torsional spring would be doing. So we applied some pin connectors right here, simulating that rotation. So upon doing that, um, we meshed and ran our scenario. And there's a great little tool where if you're just fixing your system here, so right here we're fixing our system to be locked in place with a fixed geometry fixture, is we can create what's known as a reaction force, and that will tell us the force needed to maintain um, uh, this torsion. So all I have to do is right click on results, this result force. You see right there, the torsional force of about 6.71 Newtons, or round up, would be about 6.75 Newtons. So with that, I could give that value to Laura and say, hey, we're going to need about a force of about 6.75 Newtons. I hand it back to you, Laura. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Drew. And thank you for that value. The force at the fixtures is measured to about 6.75 Newtons. That's about 1.52 pounds, right? And we all should recognize this uh, sheet from one of our favorite online catalog uh, sources. We found an off-the-shelf off spring specced at 1.8 inch pounds. Now that's kind of close to the minimum required torque value. So what we did, we just doubled up on the spring. 
that's going to account for larger phones and it's going to provide some breathing room. So we built another 3D model. And just like with the transporter, third time is a charm. It works. Thumbs up. James was also working to get the, uh, the electronics assembled. The PCB in the charging coil will be assembled to charge an Android phone. And the LED strip is assembled to the inside of the housing. And as Drew told us earlier, the powers jumped from the PC board, eliminating the need for a second power cord. All right, so our next step is to decide on surface treatments, materials, colors, and textures for our charging stands. The SOLIDWORKS Gray is just not gonna cut it in a consumer product, and we need to bring this to life. So SOLIDWORKS Visualize is a rendering software that's very intuitive. It has a what you see is what you get type of interface, so you can easily create photorealistic and high quality images. Basically, it's a visual form of simulation, Drew. It's perfect for exploring different surface treatments, like this metallic surface or a soft touch surface. We add a transparency. We played with options for the LEDs, the colors, styles, locations. Emissive appearances are available in SOLIDWORKS Visualize Professional. And here is the rendering of the final concept of the transporter. It uses the LED on the PC board to emit a soft local ribbon of light. It's complemented by the texture of the graphite housing. And here's a rendering of the final concept of the holster. So we have a clear outer housing surrounded, surrounding the charger housing. Now we can 3D print clear material using the Stratasys J750 3D printer. However, we need to be sure that we can actually mold this configuration. So, of course, we asked our simulation expert, Drew, how could we simulate this molding condition? So, Drew, I will pass it back to you and let you tell thanks, them. Thanks, Laura. Great. So, for those of you, um, very, very nice thing about the SOLIDWORKS simulation portfolio, everything's in, integrated into CAD. So, if you've dealt with any injection molding software, um, a lot of injection molding softwares aren't integrated into the CAD platform. The great thing about this is I can grab that actual configuration and jump into SOLIDWORKS Plastics. So like Laura said, this is a, um, I wanted to make be sure of our manufacturability. So this is an over-molded application where we actually have an insert and we can actually simulate that with SOLIDWORKS Plastics Professional. So the first process of this is I can define my mesh and define what's the insert, what's the actual cavity. Great. Go through the meshing process. The meshing is very, very easy and user intuitive. Because you've already sketched this part in SOLIDWORKS, um, it recognizes where your boundaries are and where they're not. So right here, it's gonna mesh at the edges themselves, and we're making sure we have enough elements through there. So let's say we wanted to actually physically edit a specific element. In this case, we see we have some aspect ratios of 23. Um, so maybe we wanna reduce that aspect ratio. Great. So via the visualization in SOLIDWORKS Plastics on the meshing, we see towards the bottom, we have some little bit of disjointed elements. All right, I want to fix those. I want to make sure they're a good sized element that properly show the plastics process. All I have to do is make that edit, and there we go, we've changed the aspect ratio to be adequate. At this point, we can now just you know, post-process our mesh a little bit further if we want. Maybe we actually want to look at the mesh through thickness just to make sure we have enough elements through thickness, and we can do that. Next process is we define our physical material. Great thing about this database, it's extensive. Um, SOLIDWORKS is constantly adding uh, materials. So we have our polymer material, our mold material, and our insert. Um, last I checked, the polymers, you know, over 4,000 different polymers. So it's probably going to be in there. If it isn't, you can actually add a custom material. Now we're going to our injection molding process, so just keying in our, our fill settings. So, you know, when it's actually shooting into the mold, how long it's going to take. Um, and then keying out, lastly, our boundary location. In this case, it's an over-molded application, a single cavity. We're having it single gated. If you're wondering, can SOLIDWORKS plant plastics handle multi-cavity molds or multi-gates? You can. You can key in runner systems and sprues. In this case, we just kind of kept it easy with um, an individual gate. 
So you see right here, we're just, you know, small parametric base. Where you see, you just click on a different location. I'm going to click on a face or an edge and specify that's the location of the actual gate itself. Great. So now that I've actually set the system up, I can now run the system. Um, just for your reference, you can run these in batch or um, run them, you know, in serially, whatever you choose to do. See right here, I'm running it serially within the Analysis Manager. Now we can take a look at the actual results in this process. All right, great. So a great thing about this is it's always going to tell you if a part can be successfully filled. So our first worry, can this part actually be filled? I don't want to have a short shot, meaning that it doesn't fill up in the mold itself. All right, so that's the first objective. Yes, it can actually be manufactured. Great. Uh, but there's other things we should be worried about. Obviously, in the injection molding process, we want to have a good fill. Um, so if we animate this, we're going to see our filling process based on the gate location. And you see, great thing. It, it's pretty uniform, but there's a couple areas you're going to see subsequently that have a couple, led to a couple of problems we, we may want to fix. So we can look at our cooling times. There's a couple locations where there's a longer bit of cooling, so that might add some structural weakness in the system. Right down there at the bottom, that's something to be aware of. Additionally, we see these sink marks. And this is a big concern. So if you're unaware what a sink mark is, it's just a surface depression. So this is a consumer-facing part. We want to uh, limit our sink marks to be in locations that the consumer is not going to see. So we had a sink mark right on the front of the part. Um, and we can change that through regating or re-changing the system or maybe changing our thing. So that's a, con a condition we want to change before we send it to the mold. Additionally, we, we see our knit lines or our weld lines here. So this is when you have two different flow front temperatures flowing into one another. If you ever look at a cheap plastic part, you'll probably see a small little line that's known as a knit line. So again, these knit lines are um, right on the back side here. Um, they're pretty good. They're kind of obscured, but I probably would want to make it some changes. So obviously we need to eliminate the sink marks and probably move these knit lines to be not as prominent for the consumer. So it can be manufactured, but we're going to have to make some changes if we're actually going to full-scale manufacture. All right. Thanks, Drew. And, you know, thankfully, SOLIDWORKS Plastics help, helped identify these problems early on in the design before we cut metal, right? We have obviously more work to do with the holster but this could have saved us some costly mold repairs so i would give this a thumbs up now the holster it generates a lot of heat you know we have the phone charging we have the pcb we have the coils we have a string of leds that are on inside the housing we needed to be sure that the materials and the components are not going to fail due to heat so we need to have another virtual prototype to test the effects of heat. And we called on Drew yet again. Great. Thanks, Laura. So great thing about this, um, we just took a look at plastics. Now we're looking at flow simulation. So both plastics and flow simulation are finite uh, volume uh, solutions. In this case, SOLIDWORKS flow simulation is a CFD solution. Again, fully integrated into CAD, and what you can do in our case, we're using it for heat transfer, but if you're wondering, can I run a fluid flow study, a valve study, you can. So in our case, our, really, our design particulars is we are now at the point where we actually wanted to do our physical electrical testing. And there's two concerns from a design perspective. First, we need to make sure we're not approaching a hot enough heat that the PCB board is not going to function. Um, and that's right around 290 degrees. Um, so we need to make, sh make sure first that the PCB is not going around that temperature. If it's too high, the PC board is not going to function. Um, the other condition is we obviously we need to make sure that this is not going to be too hot on the outside surfaces. So whoever's touching it is not going to, you know, it's not going to be uncomfortable or um, possibly be burned. So we needed to virtualize this. The great thing about this is we can define our materials in the system. So our materials. And then also our specific heat sources, so what our source of a phone as well as our PCB itself. So upon doing this, setting up the parameters of the study, we can actually look at our locations um, either through the plane or on the surfaces. So I'll first show you a cut plot, which allows us to move this through the surfaces themselves. The great thing, I can just make this normal to the view. And then I can actually right click and hit probe. And I see my temperature of the PCB, you know, it's right around 100 degrees. So it's nowhere near that limit 
of you know, 290. So it should function great. All right, so the other concern that you know, I'm you know, worried about is I want to make sure when our electrical engineer goes to physically test this out that he's not going to burn himself. So what we can do is we can actually create a surface plot. And right here, it's going to show us our temperature distribution of the system. Great. So our max temperature, around 110. If we actually physically probe this, it's around the, the foam locations. Probe it. You know, around 90 degrees, a couple areas around 102, 105, and the max 110. But again, there, I strong confidence, you know, our electrical engineer is going to be fine. He's going to be able to touch this as well as the PCB board is going to be able to function. So great. Um, those virtual prototypes are set up. So with that being said, I, I kind of gave the thumbs up to Mark to actually, um, you know, hey, we're ready to go to physical prototype. The Mark electrical engineer, he built a model to test the performance of PCB and the LED strip. So he powered this. Um, through the actual device, you see right here, the powering right here, and he wanted to do a load test. He wanted to run this on and off to see how the PCB would function charging, um, and did it for about two weeks. He, he would cycle the test on and off, um, trying to generate as much heat as possible. Obviously, when you're running it, you're not going to be generating as much heat as when you're turning it on and off. Um, the good news is that there was no noticeable effects of the LED performance or the actual charging transmission. Everything functioned great. I'd say that's a thumbs up, Laura. Awesome. All right. So the holster is good. Thanks, Drew. SolidWorks simulation helped us specify the appropriate spring. SolidWorks plastics showed us what to fix for molding and mass production. So we give that a thumbs up. SolidWorks flow simulation, along with the physical prototype, gave us the confidence that our electronics are going to operate safely with no adverse effects to the housing, or the components, or to the consumer. So we have a double thumbs up. And now we've reached the final destination with the holster. Right, so during these holster and transporter journeys, We've experienced the challenges that you face every day, having deadlines and people leaving, not being able to access the vault, delays in shipment, machines going down, personalities, all of it. We lived it. And I'm sure you can relate to some aspect of our experience. Development using the SOLIDWORKS suite of products was the easy part. 3D CAD, motion analysis, PCB, simulation, plastics, flow, all wrapped up in the PDM blanket, we made informed, calculated, and smart design decisions. And the 3D printed models provided valuable usability information. Right? We validated our findings and we improved the quality of our designs. And at the end of these journeys, we've produced some pretty cool manufacturable cell phone and headset stands. So going back to our key takeaways, for virtual prototypes, simulate. It's going to catch design issues early on in the design phase. Physical prototypes, build it. It will give you further insight into your design. It's going to show you the stuff that simulation doesn't test for. And by utilizing the SOLIDWORKS suite of products, you're not going to worry, right? You're going to make better design decisions based on analysis and not on a gut feel. One of the great things you guys can do after this uh, webinar, you can go back. Um, you may have a simulation license already, but if you don't, you have a seat of SOLIDWORKS Professional, you can actually utilize Simulation Express. So Simulation Express, for those of you unaware, it's a basic finite element analysis tool, and it's included with that seat of SOLIDWORKS. And to find it, you click on the Evaluate tab. Um, and from there, there's the Simulation Express Analysis Wizard. You click on that. Um, and then that can actually activate the system. So the great thing about this, if we go to MySolidWorks.com, there's a lot of different tutorials. Um, really, if you've never used MySolidWorks, there's a lot of great things out there, not just for Simulation Express, but for a lot of different features. But you see right here, everything I'd need in terms of setting up a system and running a basic finite element analysis. Additionally, if we Google Simulation Express, great thing about the SolidWorks um, suite of products, you're going to find some blog or article about it, you see right here, right on the SOLIDWORKS website, how to actually activate your SOLIDWORKS Simulation Express. 
All right, so in closing, we're going to leave you with the old adage, a place for everything and everything in its place. And that concludes our webinar. We thank you all very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, everyone.